So if you're thinking about creating a circular event by pulling your arms, well, it doesn't really look like it's exactly. in front of my chest. They're not going to get back, are they? Welcome back to the channel, guys. Kerry Gray here today in the studio at Pitch Golf, based in London here. Two amazing facilities. Standing next to me is Gary Munro. Gary, thanks for coming along. Thank you for coming down. Gary is a top 50 UK golf coach and the director of instruction here. Amazing two facilities to work on your golf game. And today we're going to be running through some key elements that you can implement into your golf swings, some great little outcome-based exercises and drills that could really upgrade the level of your ball striking. Let's get in. So main things I did, mm -hmm. 22 handicap, mm -hmm. struggles with pulls, a lot of toe strikes and heavy toe down lie angle. So what I worked on with him, if we look at his backswing, so he gets really deep really early with the hands. Yeah. Then as he's coming down into the ball, tries to save it as he's coming in, starts to tip back yeah. and he has this really sharp left exit mm -hmm. with the body going forward here and then left arm chicken wings on the way through. Yeah, so you can see he's like really running out of room. Right? Running out of room on the way back. If you look at his lower body, how it's driving forwards towards the ball. Yeah. So he had no room. So I suppose if we use the professional over here on the right hand side as a reference of, let's say like a reasonable model that we'll be yeah. looking at. Good hair as well. <laughs> the best. And uh, you can see why he doesn't wear a hat. <laughs> you and me are the same, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Good hair. Good hair. So we'll use these kind of reference lines uh, as a bit of an indication of what you were just talking about here. So this player was struggling with what ball flight issues? Pulls, uh, a lot of heavy toe strikes, and then just a lot of left misses. Okay, a lot of left misses. So really at the end of the day, whenever we're making a change, it's all based on the outcome of the performance. Right? Yeah. So you could stand here all day, every day in an indoor simulator like this. And yeah. It's a like, beautiful place to hang out, but I suppose people get too caught up on filming their swing to try and make it look like yes. this gentleman over here on the right hand side. Yeah. Or maybe that one day you and me. But <laughs> um, when it comes to the reason that a lot of players uh, derive their happiness and enjoyment from golf, it's all based around the score. Right? Yep. Don't get me wrong, I love hitting a ball out of the center of the club face. But at the end of the day, when you walk into the clubhouse, What's the one question that everyone asks? Yeah, they don't ask, what, what did it look like out there? How, what were your shots? They just say, what'd you shoot? <laughs> exactly. And uh, through this lesson that was pretty recent for you, you came to this conclusion that through your analysis and you spent a fair bit of time asking some really detailed questions so you could get an understanding of this player's sort of expectations yep. of what they wanted to achieve, was that this was your diagnosis of why they were struggling with their ball flight control. Yeah. Yeah. So if we look at the comparison here relative to the professional on the left versus the right, we can see, yeah, that club head's kind of moving in around a little bit in the backswing and this trail arm definitely relative to what we see in the professional golfer over here on the right hand side, it's certainly a lot more bent on the left, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. You can see it pulls in early. Yeah, and we often see this with a lot of amateur golfers. It's almost like they're um, pulling the golf club away with their hands because their concept of a golf swing is more of this kind of bigger round motion with the yeah. arms, rather understanding that golf is a rotary, powerful sport that you use with your body a lot, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So explaining further on now from here on the left-hand side, talk me through it. So he's going around a little bit, as you can see, trail arms bending. So as the trail arm pulls in, mm -hmm. he gets his hands into a very deep position, right Correct. arm very much behind him. Yeah. And then from there... Let's, let's just quickly make mention for the guys here, right, about this classical look that you see the lead arm kind of covering the shoulder plane. Shoulder plane, yeah. Right? Now that's not essential because there are many good players who have uh, won majors with the lead arm going low. Yeah. However, this guy, he's not really putting the same time and effort into his golf is what they would be doing. So Correct. therefore it's just, it's one of those areas that just leads to more inconsistency, doesn't it? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So his lead arms pulled across the body. You can see quite a distance really. Between the gap of the elbows. Yeah, yeah. Look, at the, look at the distance of here relative to the professional. Right, so the elbow position, but then also exactly what you said, like the distance between the elbows, right? Yeah. He's almost doubled that. Yeah. He's almost doubled that. And that comes purely from his takeaway, from that, that right arm retracting as soon as he pulls back, mm. the distance is increasing between the gap, and that's why he's getting up to there. Mm. And I suppose it sounds like similar, very or very similar coaching practice to myself is that we find that for the majority of golfers, if you can tidy up their setup, yeah. you can work on 
they take away in their backs when you get them into a reasonable position. Yes. Right? Where they're not all bunched up in octopus arms. Well, then they've got a much better chance of striking the ball in a consistent yeah. fashion. Yeah. Correct? And that's exactly what you did with this gentleman here. And then what you can see from the beginning of the swing here is really uh, from that trail arm pulling that we were just talking about, it's more about the sequence of the swing, keeping those hands relatively in front of the chest, right? Yes. So even though this gentleman spent a lot of time kind of focusing on how his arms were really bunched up and they didn't have much room, the only reason is because his arms went so far behind his body, yeah. right? Now, relative to the, the conversation that you had with him, uh, he had had some context around keeping the hands in front of the chest. And what we see with the professional over here on the right hand side is really, if you were to kind of isolate this, you go hands in front of the chest, yep. you see the chest is facing right there. And then as he moves through the ball, you can see from that angle there, hands in front of the chest. Whereas this gentleman in this frame over here on the left hand side, chest is pointing over there, hands way back in, I don't know, what's a real remote place in UK somewhere. <laughs> and then hands going straight around the body. Yep. So the arms are pulling behind and then coming back in front. Yep. So to work on this area of this swing, right, yep. I want you to show me a little bit of what you were doing. So I actually introduced two things mm -hmm. with this gentleman. The first thing, I actually started with where the club needs to be after impact. Okay, great. Because right, he didn't actually have a concept of where the club needs to travel here. Yeah, great. And what I found with him, because his club traveled so inwards, everything was pulling across, mm. one, I actually educated him that the through swing, his arms and his club need to be a bit further away from him. Mm. All of a sudden he could feel the distance between the club and his body. And lengthening in the lead arm. Yeah. Lengthening the lead arm. And then I just simply said to him, so how is that club going to get to that position? Yeah. And then I said, just work it back. And then he just, all he did was he put the club behind the ball. Yep. And I said, okay, how does it get there? Just draw the line. And he went all the way back to here. And he just learned from that position that he had more space and the lead arm was straight. Mm. And it's very interesting that you noted that. So set up to that ball for me again, right? So there may have been a bit of, oh, wow, what moment with this golfer? Because we've detailed and he would have filmed himself and he saw the golf club move on the inside, right? Yeah. And then when you've gotten him to go to the follow through, you've actually just asked him to go to the inside again, but the issue is not the inside takeaway. Yeah. It's the actual movement of the torso relative to the arms, correct? Correct. Yeah, so when we're actually moving this player back into position, and you started in this follow through position, which I love because having the end in mind really helps. Yeah. I like to liken it to, let's say you're teaching a kid how to throw, and the kid just finishes like this, right? Well, then you go, oh, you're on your front foot, point to where you want the ball to go. Yeah. Now, to a degree, a recreational golfer learning this game, it's very, very challenging to think about the mechanics of what that would happen or what yes. would need to happen for that to occur. But if you just simply said, we're going to educate you on where this golf club needs to finish. Yeah. All right, let's figure out how to get back there, yeah. right? And that's exactly what we did. So yeah. jump back in there. And from that position, so you got him as this golf club was working back, right? Did you get him to feel like the chest and the arms were kind of driving the motion, Correct. maybe a little bit of body turn rather than this yanking and pulling of the arms. So I got him, one of the drills, I put the club into the stomach. Yep. And I just said, try and get a turn. Mm -hmm. So what he would do normally, his arms would have done it, just pulled there, mm. his chest is still pointing to the ball. So mm. what I did was just turn everything and he could feel everything turn as one motion, one yeah, piece takeaway. Love that, love that. And I suppose there's a huge misconception as I was alluding to before. Uh, I'll just jump in here for a sec of this first section of the backswing, right? People think this around motion that you see with the golf swing, yeah. this circular event, is all created from the arms, yeah. right? But what we see with the pros is that every high level golfer starts with their hands in front of their chest at the dress, correct? Yep. Right? And if you freeze frame every single professional golfer, they get their hands back in front of their yep. chest. So if you're thinking about creating a circular event by pulling your arms, well, it doesn't really look like it's exactly. in front of my chest. They're not going to get back, are they? So guess what they're going to do, right? We get to the top of the swing. The lead arm's really low and pinned. Yeah. Right. Might look a little bit by Cooch, but Cooch gets it done, right? <laughs> so as we get this behind us, well, then this player, with every force in his body, is trying to get his arms back in front. Pulls in. And we can see that he pulls in around. Yeah. So the thing I really love about this little drill that you gave this guy is if he's practicing at an indoor venue such as this, which is just so yep. incredible for working on your game for a multitude of benefits. But if we are following through, okay, yep. and when we were talking about this lesson before we started today, 
we were making mention that you actually also got him to feel that the club head and the chest was in line. Weren't you? Yeah. So one of the reference point that you gave this gentleman was that, yeah, it might feel like it's a little bit more on the inside, but doing these little half swings to start off with, guess what? Everything's in sync. Yeah, the body and the club are moving together. Body and club can move through. Mm. It massively changed contact. And then we used Foresight here to look at the path. Mm. He went from eight out to in, yeah. toe strikes. All of a sudden his path started to move. His start direction was much better because of it. Yeah, incredible. So out to in path, keeping it real simple, is when the golf club tracks in this direction here, yes. right? And you said eight degrees? Yeah. Now, if you're thinking about, if this is a zero line, right? It's probably nowhere near it, but let's go with it. Uh, let's say this is a zero line here. Eight degrees at the moment of impact is here. Yeah. Now imagine that 300 meters down in that direction. Yeah. All right, that's getting further and further and further away. So a golf club moving eight degrees across in this direction, he needed to do some serious work with his club face. Correct. To kind of keep that puppy straight. And his arms are bunching up and yeah. that's where that comes from. So even though a lot of players might film their swing in this instance, right? And they might look at the follow through. And if he just took a screenshot or a snapshot of that image, he might go, oh, I need to work on my chicken wing. Yeah. Right? But as we can see, it's much more of like a sequence issue, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So you got this player from his setup. Let's uh, walk me through that drill again for me. So the first thing I showed him was that, where it needs to be. Mm -hmm. So he learned that everything was pointing together. Left arm was much straighter. And as a consequence, he, felt, he said he got more space. Huge. Then as he worked it back, and then he worked it into this takeaway position, immediately he could see everything was in sync with the club and the body. Yeah. And his right arm was in a much better position from here. And I just got him to hit basically punch chip shots to start 50 to 100 yards like this. Mm -hmm. And then he'd actually started to get his golf ball to start much straighter. Mm -hmm. And his path was shifting across. And until he could get the numbers that I wanted, we got him closer to a neutral path. Then I'd let him hit it a bit harder, yeah. and a little bit harder, a little bit harder. Yeah. So I think it's really important when people make changes, you can tell them the information, they immediately go, okay, yeah, and they try and hit it as hard as they can. Huge. They don't have any time to actually do what they're trying to do. Yeah. So dropping the speed, actually saying, forget about distance for five minutes, mm. just do these little drills, build it up. Okay, you've got your numbers, you've got your data, now hit it a bit harder, mm. and then you can see that you can keep the swing. And it might then revert back to his old swing at a certain speed, and I'll just say, you're not quite ready to swing at that speed yet, mm. just drop it down and do some drills. <laughs> one, of, one of my favorite analogies to use, because I think storytelling and coaching is so important, Yeah. because people remember it, right? One of my favorite stories to use when it comes to the speed in which you should learn golf is like if I said to you, you are never allowed to tie your shoelaces in the same way you always have. Like First of all, you'd look at your shoelaces. Yeah, that's I don't even while. I don't even know what, right? And then, okay, so you wake up in the morning, let's pretend it's like Squid Games and yeah. something bad's gonna happen and you get it wrong. <laughs> so you're down and you're gonna tie your shoelaces, but you don't even know what you actually do in the first place. Yeah. So then you kind of do this like really fast, really quick, and before you know it, you spend 10 minutes and you haven't even tied shoelaces because you don't want to make the same errors, right? And that's kind of like what most people do with their golf swing. Yeah. So taking your time, being slow and conscious and intentional around the movements is incredibly important. What you detailed here, uh, very slow swings, keeping everything in sync. Yeah. And I love that drill. Did you give him any little feedback or obs obstacles to miss or anything like that? Just just a simple one. I put a tea peg, you put a tea peg or a golf ball. Tea peg, tea peg, that's such a UK saying. Tea peg. Tea peg. I put it in front, just here. Yep. Some players I use avoidance drills. Yep. Some players I use something for them to follow. Yep. So if I wanted an avoidance, I could have maybe put a head cover or something here to stop his club tracking in to visualize it. But I just use this as a visual to say, try and get the club head to track over that. Mm -hmm. And then the other little drill or the feeling I gave it was, I put something a bit further and try and get him to feel like his club is traveling and actually reaching over that tee peg in front of him. Yeah. So as he was coming through, he felt that the club was stretched over here yeah. and more straight. Reality was it was in between the old and the new. Yeah. And then on the back swing, just so he could have a picture of where the club needs to be, I put another tee peg. And then moving out there. And uh, if you jump in there, I'll show you one of my favorite exercises to do with players as well, right? Is I try and get them to exaggerate things as much as possible. Yeah. Now, you've got a $40,000 Australian GC quad there, so we're not gonna smash that. <laughs> but if your golf club, right, and I said to you, in the follow through, so you're gonna make a tiny little backswing for me, you're gonna swing over the top of the ball, try and get the golf club head tracking on this side of this club. Right, how exaggerated is that? Yeah. Thing? Right, and even if you were doing like dry drills, and you, you and myself, we play golf our whole lives, it's actually challenging, isn't it? Yeah. So give me a little bit more speed now and try and brush the ground and go over there. Now, of course, that's an extreme exaggeration. Yeah of what would need to happen. But 
When you've got a controlled environment like this, okay, indoor facilities are great for working on your game because you can put the ball in the same place every yeah. single time. Right? You can control how you go about your practice, which sometimes out in the elements, you've got divots, you've got wind, you've got your mates in your ear. There's all sorts of stuff going on, right? Yeah. It makes it incredibly challenging to build up some consistency. And when you think about how you learn any other skill in life, a lot of it is based around putting yourself in some sort of controlled environment so you can then see when you're improving. Yeah. Because how often, if they were hitting off a, a range, for example, uh, and you do coaching as well at a facility not far from here, but if they're hitting shots off the range and you are not replacing the ball for them, sometimes the awareness of what the amateur golfer does is they'll put a ball in a divot, yeah. right? And I'm looking at the ball sometimes and I'm teaching, I'm like, I see it all I played the time golf in my whole well. life and there's no way in hell I could even hit yeah. that. And you're trying to do a drill that you've never done before and get that ball out. It's just, you may as well play a bunker shot. I, I, I find <laughs> in here, people, because the bays are a little bit more private, yeah. people will actually do the drills and they're more committed to those changes versus on the driving range, you've got that embarrassment. If you do a drill and let's say you, you shank it or you top it, mm. you immediately see that ball flight mm. and you feel the embarrassment because there's other people in that driving range that might Huge. be watching. Huge. In here, actually, you can hit the shot and you can actually look at the numbers and you can go, actually, Everything was good apart from maybe contact on that one. Yeah. So I got three positive things that I was working on, I got, but I just didn't get strike. Do it a few more times, get the strike. They commit to changes much more. Yeah, and I, I myself teach in an indoor private facility, right? So in to, indoor to outdoor, we hit out of this garage, right? Yeah. Avoiding the kangaroos. And when you're standing <laughs> in there and you're hitting these shots out of this bay and it's segmented off, you feel that the person is a lot more comfortable just yeah. from being there, right? Now, you've also got the added benefit of having a bar just there that they can go ahead and skull some beers yeah. if they're feeling really nervous. If you're having a real bad one, you just, <laughs> you just get the bartender to come over and get you some drinks. Exactly, that lesson was great. So when it comes to this gentleman's change, uh, we really work through kind of the end in mind, yeah. giving him an understanding that the hands need to stay relatively in front of the body yeah. rather than pulling around. Correct. Uh, we saw the professional versus the amateur example at the beginning. And through those changes, uh, not only did he feel a lot more confident with where that golf club was because you gave him the feedback, he saw the data, which is so important when you are trying to work on your swing. Yes. If you don't have video or a mirror, is some sort of feedback, some sort of feedback. Yeah. Uh, controlled environment, incredible facility, good coaching. Thank Cheers. you. Thank <laughs> you.